Aegis, movie review. So this is a Japanese film. Uh, the Japanese title is Bokoku no Aegis. Uh, sorry for the bad pronunciation. It came out in 2005. I was living in Japan at the time, and I remember it caused a minor controversy at the time. Uh, Japan's neighbors, uh, China and Korea, did not like it. They thought it was kind of a militaristic film, and China and Korea are always very nervous about Japan uh, returning to embrace its once militaristic ways. <clears throat> On the face of it, though, I mean, if you just look at the plot of the movie, it's fairly harmless. There's a terrorist who's of some sort of foreign origin. <clears throat> I might have missed something. I could never tell if he was Chinese or Korean. Uh, you, you know, like, I was watching this film, obviously, across a language barrier, so possibly I missed something. But anyways, the terrorist takes over a Japanese self-defense force ship, Together with a, disaffect, with a group of disaffected senior Japanese military officers, they have a secret weapon, which is called Guso, which is some sort of super chemical weapon stolen from an American base. They threaten to release this weapon over Tokyo unless their demands are met. Fortunately, we have two heroes who are on board the ship already, and they battle the terrorists through the decks of the ship. Uh, the whole thing is so amazingly similar to that old Steven Seagal movie, Under Siege. Uh, I've also heard this movie referred to as Die Hard on a Boat, which I suppose Under Siege was essentially Die Hard on a Boat, so I, yeah, I mean, whatever. Um, now this is another Japanese movie which kind of seems to be competing with Hollywood by imitating Hollywood. There are so many Hollywood cliches in this movie. Uh, for example, there's a bad guy who just wounds the hero, but then doesn't finish him off. And then as he's just kind of turning to walk away, then the hero uh, comes back and defeats the bad guy. Uh, in fact, this scene plays out twice. It happens not once, but twice. Uh, the principal bad guy is kind of like the Terminator. There's a Terminator-like ending where he just refuses to die no matter how many times he's shot. Also, near the end of the movie, the ship is creeping towards Tokyo Bay. Uh, and at one point it's going to get to the point of no return, where if they launch the secret weapon there's going to be no way to stop them in time. Now, there's a discussion in the war room in, in Tokyo whether to bomb the ship and take it out, uh, but our two heroes are still on the ship, or give our heroes just a little bit more time to finish it off by themselves, to complete their mission and regain control of the ship. The seconds tick by. Finally, they make the decision to send the planes out to bomb the ship. But just at the last minute, well, I don't want to spoil anything for you. Um, suffice, to, suffice it to say, though, I think perhaps you've seen this thing a million times before in other Hollywood movies, so you can probably tell where this is going. Tired Hollywood cliches aside, the main reason that this film caused so much unease in Korea at the, in China and Korea at the time of its release was not really because of the plot of the movie, but because of all the speeches that are made throughout the movie. There's a whole lot of talk about what Japan as a nation stands for and what the future of Japan should be. Now, Japan as a nation is experiencing an identity crisis, or at least it was during the time I lived there. I, presumably the issue is still current. Uh, Japan used to be a strong militaristic nation, but they just got absolutely creamed in the last war that they fought. So they've adopted a pacifist constitution, and instead they focused on becoming an economic powerhouse. And then the bubble economy burst, and then they weren't really sure what they stood for. So, a lot of people in this movie are making speeches about what does Japan stand for, really? And 
As an example of the current zeitgeist as represented in cinema, uh, this film perhaps has some value. You can easily imagine that 50 or 100 years from now, people are going to cite this film in their research papers when they go to talk about Japan's political identity at the beginning of the 21st century. But as something that's kind of adding to the current debate here and now, I'm not really sure what the film is adding to the debate. I mean, there's a lot of questions being asked, but no answers being given. So it's not really contributing to the debate other than to kind of ask the question. There's a lot of scenes with characters standing around talking about the problem of Japan's identity, but no solutions are put forward. And even as far as stating the problem, not much is ever said in concrete terms. I don't know, maybe a domestic Japanese audience would catch on to the subtleties of these discussions better than I could. The best I could say for this film is that if you ignore all the Hollywood cliches, and if you ignore some of the plot holes, there are some halfway decent action scenes, so it does have some mild entertainment value.